Welcome back to this episode of the Law of Relevancy podcast. Today, I am very excited to bring you my very special guest, Pete Zinnaber. Very pleased to be here, Courts. Pete, you've been recognized um, as being an award-winning attorney, one of the most award-winning attorneys, voted to many, many significant lists of attorneys, top 100, best attorney in the state. How do you win so many amazing awards like that? That's somewhat mysterious because <laughs> because um, uh, the the input into those recognitions is generally provided by your peers and by your clients, and uh, we don't know. Those of us who are rated have no idea who is being uh, uh, contacted for input. Um, although we have a pretty good idea because some of us have been at this for quite some time. I was admitted to practice in 1969. Wow. So I've been doing this for 53 years. Uh, but I think, uh, I think that a lot of it is simply, um, and, and, and I will have to tell you that uh, the three most important aspects of the practice of law to me are professionalism, civility, and ethics. If, if you observe those three qualities, if you have those, and you treat other lawyers with respect, with professionalism, with civility, then no matter, no matter what subject matter expertise you have, you will always be appreciated right. by the people, even people that you litigate against. Well, there certainly is a professional discourse in the way to communicate with one another to help get to a resolution with a lot of these cases that sometimes the, the, the judgment might be in limbo. You might be in question, right? Are there any cases that you have that stand out to you where uh, some of maybe the more interesting cases you've dealt with in your career? Um, well, one of the... Um even though uh, my practice has been 98% labor and employment representing employers uh, in my field, and that, that would include all aspects of labor and employment except for immigration mm -hmm. and drafting uh, employee benefits plans. Those two things I don't do, but everything else uh, uh, I've, I've done in one degree or another. Um, and you know a, a lot of these these cases that I found really interesting were cases of first impression, which means the issue had never been decided either in the jurisdiction where I was uh, litigating or uh, in the circuit court that governs, for instance, the Eleventh mm -hmm. Circuit Court of Appeals, which governs Georgia, Florida, and Alabama, uh, or in the United States Supreme Court. So. Uh, to me, the most interesting cases are the ones involving issues that have never been decided before, at least in your jurisdiction. Can you think of any particular case where there was the first impression? Well, uh, I will tell you that uh, one case that I had um, uh, probably in the... In the um, I would say uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, was a case that the NAACP filed against the city of Tampa and all of its city councilmen, mm -hmm. county commission, uh, all of the commissioners, uh, the supervisor of election, and the mayor. Uh, and what they were trying to do, uh, their, their thesis, their, their premise was, that, that all of these legislative bodies, and these are legislative bodies of government, uh, up until that point were, sing were, were at large uh, uh, positions, which meant that every eligible voter in Hillsborough County or the city of Tampa had a right to vote for every city council person and every county commissioner. The, out the, the outcome of that voting routinely was that African Americans and to some extent Hispanics could not get elected because whites outnumbered 
both groups significantly. Yeah. And so both bodies <clears throat> were consistently all white. The NAACP wanted to convert <laughs> both the county commission and the city council to single member districts. Mm. Uh, that way assuring that at least some blacks would be elected to positions in the city council and the county commission. And, and uh, uh, my firm and I uh, represented uh, the city, the county, the commissioners, mm -hmm. the election supervisor, uh, and, uh, and defended those cases. And, and we settled the cases uh, in a way that, that is operating in Hillsborough County and the city of Tampa to this day. Uh, and that is that we have four, three systems. Um, I believe that there are four at-large council members and three um, uh, single member districts in each body, uh, mm -hmm. ensuring minority representation, at least to some extent. Uh, and that at that time was a major, major issue in the civil rights movement. Uh, I was really excited to be part of that process. And you, I, in my research, I found that you have had some additional experience with the civil rights movement. Um, where were you in 1963? Well, uh, in 1963, I was uh, actually uh, at the University of Florida, and, and I believe that I was still thinking about pre-med at the time. Uh, but my summer job, I worked every, every break that I had uh, because my parents uh, uh, were not, not well-to-do. And I was a forklift operator and warehouseman at the Montgomery Wards Regional Warehouse in St. Petersburg. And uh, uh, I was um, aware uh, midsummer that there was a civil rights march planned for Washington, D.C. Uh, I had read some press releases about it. It seemed like a, an exciting opportunity, sure. uh, opportunity to be part of history. Uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who I went to high school with. And on a Friday afternoon after I got off from Montgomery Wards, we got into my little Volkswagen Beetle and we drove straight through uh, from St. Petersburg to Washington, D.C. with only one slight detour. Did you happen to see that? No, I didn't see the detour. Well, the detour was, uh, and, and as most people who have driven Volkswagen Beetles know, top speed uh, is generally about, uh, for those <laughs> cars at that time, about 62 miles an hour, unless you were going downhill. Oh, okay. And if you were at the top of a hill heading down, you could usually get it up to about 70. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, at about 10 o'clock in the evening, we were going through South Carolina, and I was going downhill, and at the bottom of the hill was a Smokey. Oh, okay. A state trooper uh, who pulled me over. Uh, and he said uh, to me, he said, where do you think you are going? What town were you in? I was, I believe, in in uh, Somerville. Okay. It was, it was uh, there were no interstates then, so I think I was on 301. <coughs> uh, and it was about 10 o'clock in the evening, mm -hmm. and he said, where do you think you are going? Mm -hmm. Now, you might argue that this was uh, what turned me uh, around and, and caused me to wonder whether I shouldn't be in in uh, law school instead or instead of going to med school, mm -hmm. because I said, "Well, uh, uh, trooper, I I'm heading to Washington D.C. for a Baptist Student Leadership Conference," mm -hmm. because I didn't think it would sell very well in South Carolina <laughs> to tell him that we were going to a civil rights march. Uh, and he said, "Well, in that case." He said, come over to this Gulf Oil gas station. My friend is open all night. Yeah. And he said, I'll let you pay the fine uh, and let you get out of here. And I said, well, I don't have any money. Uh, all I have is a credit card. And he said, well, why don't you take that credit card? It was a Gulf Oil credit card. Yeah. And buy a water pump that you don't need. And my friend who owns the gas station will give you the money for the water pump, gotcha. and you can pay me, and, oh you're, and you're, you're off scot-free. And we did it, and we paid the trooper, and made it up to Washington, and we were there for the entire march, including the, the uh, Martin Luther King 
uh, famous I've Got a Dream speech. Oh, my gosh. So you were there when he made the speech. Yes, that's incredible. absolutely. Right there on the reflecting pool. Oh, that's so cool. That was a pretty important moment in our history. And much more important than we ever assumed it would be. You know, two college kids who, who were just, you know, looking for a, an exciting experience in a, in a weekend. So since then, obviously, your specialty in law is about discrimination. Yes. And so I, I assume you've come across many cases of different types of discrimination, and uh, it's gotten to be a pretty hot topic lately. Yes. You know, it seems like it's, it's been quite, quite uh, the, the topic of conversation since the mid-2000s or so about, about numerous things. Where are we headed with discrimination law? Because it seems almost like it, it just keeps evolving. It's almost like at some point it was like, hey, we don't want to see race at all. And now it seems like we're going past that to more of like an affirmative, um, positive rights kind of disposition on the whole thing. Where are we going with uh, discrimination law? It amazes <clears throat> me as somebody who uh, was in college mm -hmm. when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed uh, and uh, has worked in this field for as long as I have. It amazes me that people uh, who operate businesses uh, are still making the same mistakes Mm. that they made in the 1960s. Uh, and uh, uh, so there is, there is certainly a market for what we do, uh, we being employment lawyers. Sure. Uh, in 1988, uh, actually 1991, uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act was amended to add the opportunity to get punitive and compensatory damages in a jury trial. Sure. Lo and behold, <clears throat> what that did was it opened up enormous opportunities for lawyers representing plaintiffs to make a lot of money in these kinds of cases. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, it 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 uh, it really did. Um, um, it, it was the 1991 amendments to the Civil Rights Act, and so it's really exploded. And again, um, people keep making the same mistakes, uh, especially in the area of sexual harassment, right? Uh, and and uh, you know traditional discrimination cases, uh, the sort of the obvious forms of discrimination, right? Uh, are not as prevalent now as they used to be, but there are more subtle things. For instance. In the last uh, four years, uh, uh, sexual preference has been added judicially to the scope of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So, in other words, discriminating based upon sexual preference mm -hmm. uh, is prohibited. Now, transgender uh, <clears throat> is considered to be, ba based upon a case out of Georgia mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, uh, transgender is now uh, a protected status under the Civil Rights Act. So um, uh, no matter how many decisions are issued by the various courts, there always seem to be new issues. One of the major new issues right now is the issue of affirmative action yeah. and whether or not affirmative action uh, is something that, that uh, violates the United States Constitution. Um, uh, there was a, uh, an executive order in 1963 that was adopted by the federal government requiring federal contractors to create affirmative action plans. Right. That's been in effect uh, since 1963. But uh, within the last three or four years, there have been challenges, mainly in the universities uh, around the country, who have used affirmative action to increase the number of minorities right. uh, who attend their colleges. Harvard is involved in litigation now uh, before the United States Supreme Court. And those Court. are really like cases involving the inverse, where yes. you have groups. So you, you're trying to promote one group, but what ends up happening is you're pushing down another group in order to do that. Yes, yes. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, I think most, not all, but most people are comfortable with the idea 
of, of a remedy for a wrong. Mm -hmm. So if there's been a, a wrong, a discrimination, a retaliation, a harassment, uh, then there ought to be a remedy for it. Yeah. Uh, but affirmative action is a concept that doesn't necessarily involve a wrong that is a tangible, identifiable wrong uh, to be remedied. Affirmative right. action is a numbers game, if you will. Right. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Well, that's a, a definitely a, um, a topic that can get, you know, pretty involved and deep quickly yeah. in terms of those things. One of the areas of uh, that's exploded in the last, uh, I would say, 15 years is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Right. And the number of different claims that arise based upon uh, uh, the theory that an employee uh, was entitled to a reasonable accommodation yeah. for a disability. Uh, and and it's a very, very complex statute involving a great deal of, of uh, individualized proof. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, one of the cases that I thought was sort of an interesting case that I had was, was uh, an employee. I had a call from a client of mine in a company, uh, and uh, my client, uh, a human resources uh, director, said, I've got an employee who has multiple personality disorders. Oh, my goodness. And one of those personalities hates his supervisor. Oh, what my God. What can we do? And so... That sounds pretty unique. If, <laughs> I had never had one like that. First impression, if e you will. Exactly. Yeah. It was first impression. <laughs> and and uh, uh, by the way, the, you know, there may be some people who want to know how that one came out. I advised uh, the company to fire the individual because because the bad personality dominated everything else, and he mm. couldn't get along with his his manager. So that's a perfect example of some of the advice you have to give right. to your customers. And you went obviously early on. You referenced those components of what makes someone a good attorney: the integrity. Um, some of the other pieces. Civility, Civility. ethics, and professionalism. Right. And, and actually, uh, if you know, you've, uh, you've told me that you've looked over my, my biography, one of the things that I've recently done, I served six years as a member of the board of uh, uh, directors of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers, which is um, a group of, of senior level labor and employment lawyers who have been recognized by membership of the college. And... Uh, the three principles, unifying principles of the college are ethics, civility, and professionalism. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things that when you've, we've had discussions about your firm now that is very relevant because the reason you would have very tenured and senior people in those positions is because they've seen so much. Right. So what is the advantage of working with a firm like what you're in now versus the firm that you founded? But we have 950 lawyers in 58 offices, most of them in the United States. Mm -hmm. We have some in Europe and uh, one in Mexico City. Um, and, and every one of those lawyers practices in the labor and employment field. So there's, there's virtually nothing that, that uh, comes in the door in the way of a of a, of a legal issue or a problem or a case that somebody in, in uh, my firm has not had experience working with. And so what you do is you send out a blast email and you ask uh, uh, everybody, all 950 lawyers, has anyone had this issue come up? Mm -hmm. And invariably, uh, some of the lawyers will say, yes, I just had that that uh, problem come up uh, uh, last month in Seattle or in Los Angeles or in Chicago. Uh, and uh, uh, I had one national client, I do a lot of work for national clients, one national client said, we need advice in the following uh, six cities where we have large offices on, on how they deal with the issue of COVID in the workplace. And so I was able to uh, connect this client, which is based in New York City, uh, their, their legal uh, general counsel's office, 
I connected that uh, that office with lawyers, partners of mine in each of those six cities who advised them as to what the city and the state does uh, to deal with the issue of COVID in the workplace. Uh, can you have a mandate for vaccinations? Right. Uh, uh, in Florida, of course, there's a question as to whether or not a mandate was was permissible. Yeah. And, and if it isn't, what, what would the state do about it? Uh, other states have similar restrictions. So, you know, it, it many, many of the things that we deal with uh, vary from state to state. And so having the number of, diff- of people practicing what we do in right. different states g- enables us to give advice all over the country and, and in, in several European countries as to how these issues are handled. Well, having access to that much information and knowledge and, and practical application of the law at your fingertips. Yeah, you know, sometimes people complain about how much attorneys cost per hour, but in that case, it seems like it's a heck of a deal because you've got so much information yes. right there at your fingertips. Because if you didn't have those resources available to you, then your lawyer in Tampa, Florida, would end up having to do the legal research for each of the five or six states. And it's going to cost considerably more right. money to get that answer than it, than it would the way that we handle it. Makes perfect sense to yeah. me. One of the things that I don't think a lot of people know about you is how involved you've been in the music business and the community and the arts and the communities. And uh, I'd love to sh- for you to share a little bit about that with us. Well... Uh, Of course, I will have to tell you that for me, uh, and and by the way, music is not the only creative outlet that people have. Some people are painters, some people are poets, Mm -hmm. some people are, uh, they they perform in in, uh, local theater groups. Uh, Having that creative outlet to me is so incredibly important. I've been uh, performing Uh, on brass instruments since sixth grade. Uh, And um, uh, I was the principal euphonium player at the University of Florida Symphonic Band for nine years while I was there, undergraduate, graduate school, and law school. I was the uh, featured soloist uh, in the uh, symphonic band on tour for three years, uh, getting up in front of the band and playing a solo. Uh, I played French horn in the symphony orchestra, trumpet and brass choir, and I taught myself recorders so I could play in a, in a Baroque recorder consort. Um, and I did that for eight years while I was there. So uh, it, is, it is such a, a, a wonderful creative outlet for me, and it, and it adds so much balance in my life to be, to, to be able to create in that way right now I play in two community bands here in Hillsborough County, uh, the Tampa Community Band on Wednesday nights and the Eastern Hillsborough Community Band on Thursday nights. Both of them are really great organizations. We have a lot of fun and we play for an awful lot of people who would not otherwise benefit from the music that we make. So it's- Where would we find that when those performances? Uh, the, um, uh, I will I will tell you that that uh, the Tampa Community Band generally plays uh, in assisted living facilities and nursing homes, mm-hmm. but we do have a concert. Glad you asked. Uh, on uh, March, I think it's Sunday, March fifth, in Plant Park, right right outside the University of Tampa Plant Museum, and it's called Picnic in the Park, and it starts. There's a, a stage, and there are five acts that perform on stage from noon to five. And we are the first act at noon. Wow. How many members of your band are there? We have 45 members in that band. And we have 85 members in the Eastern Hillsborough Band. And the Eastern Hillsborough Band plays generally in, because it's such a large band, we play in large churches in the Brandon area. Wow. What kind of music do you play? Um, What songs? Well... We do a, a number of Broadway show tune medleys, like we're doing Chicago mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in this coming concert. Uh, we have um, a Frank Sinatra medley. We have a um, uh, Tina Turner. Uh, uh, 
it, it, it's it's like a mixture of the of Broadway and pops. We have a Glenn Miller uh, medley that we play, um, and uh, uh, I think the band in, in uh, Brandon is a little bit more serious. You know, the the music is a little bit more challenging. Yeah. But both bands are good bands with good musicians. These are these are players who have been doing this for 30 and 40 and more years. And I will have to tell you, and this is probably going to amaze you, um, when I joined the Tampa Community Band in 2002, 2001, one of our saxophone players had played with John Philip Sousa. Oh, my goodness. He played until he was 93. A clarinet player... Uh, named Joe Gugino, played with us until the age of 102. Now, did he make mistakes? Yes, he did. But nobody cared because he was 102 years yeah. old. No, I mean, that just brings... I mean, so one of the, the bucket list things I have, I have a, a grand piano that I... A baby grand piano that I inherited, and I can't play any music whatsoever. But when I have tried, I've tried to teach myself, taken some, you know, some online training and things like that. When I've tried, one of the things that that hits me is the cadence of it all. Yeah. It's a different part of the brain that helps, at least when I am trying to learn music and trying to play songs, it teaches me patience. It teaches me that there are things that are going to come when they're supposed to come. And, uh, and I don't know if, if if I'm the only person that thinks that or not, but but it, it, it is a different part of the brain. It's definitely an exercise. And one of these days when I have more time on my hands, I definitely am going to take lessons yeah. and learn how to play that instrument. When I, I graduated from law school in uh, March of 1969, and this yeah. is this is definitely not on my biography, but it's it's a funny story. Um, when I graduated uh, uh, in March of 1969. One of my classmates, Grover Robinson, who mm -hmm. became a legislator in Pensacola, uh, approached me and he said, Pete, what are you doing for the next three months? <laughs> and I said, well, I was planning on going down to St. Petersburg, which is where my family was mm -hmm. living, and, and studying for the bar exam. And then when my one of my roommates graduates, we're going to go up to Washington at the end of June and get a job. And he said, well, can I, can I induce you to stay here in Gainesville for three months. And I said, well, Grover, why would I want to do that? He says, because I happen to know that you've been pitching a slow pitch softball in the law league for two years and you've never won a championship. And he said, I am putting together the dream team. <laughs> and if you will stay, you're the pitcher. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is to find a way to support yourself for and three months. And work on that knuckleball. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I got uh, a job as a waiter at the Kappa Alpha Theta sorority house. Yeah. Uh, I uh, got a job as a part-time law librarian at the law school. And I taught recorder lessons to med students for $10 a half an hour. I just put a notice up on the <clears throat> bulletin board in the medical school and got hired to teach recorder to med students. Uh, uh, and and uh, spent three years. Now you're gonna you're gonna follow this up with a question. I know that what the question is gonna be. Keep going. Did you win the, the league? Yes. Yeah, there you go. Cadence. Yes. Patience. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Well, I think, so, I mean, obviously you've got a love for music. You're very talented at it. it, it I guess it just comes naturally to you. Yes, it's, 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 easily. it's a great love, a great love. And you've uh, given back a lot to the community Well, in music. Um, I, am, I served 16 years on the board of the Florida Orchestra um, uh, between 73 and 80, I guess, 87 so that would be 14 years. I was chairman of the board uh, for, t for two years, and I was general counsel and chief labor counsel during that period of time. Since then, I've come back on the board. I'm, I've been on the board for, another, uh, for the last six years, uh, and I love the orchestra. I think it is an absolute treasure 
uh, that we have in this community. It really is. It, it is amazing how good it is. Uh, so that is a labor of love. Um, when I when I came here to uh, Tampa, I knew that I wanted to get involved. I transferred down with the United States government with the National Labor Relations Board. And we're, when you're a prosecutor, you don't feel as comfortable getting involved in the community. But once I joined a private law firm, mm -hmm. I started to get involved. Uh, one of the things I did was uh, join the Chamber of Commerce uh, and, and become chairman of the Cultural Affairs Committee. One of my classmates at uh, law school was Bruce Smathers, who turned out he was, uh, his father was a United States Senator in Florida. And, and Bruce ran for Secretary of State oh, wow. here in, in, uh, in <clears throat> Florida. He won the job and he asked me whether or not I'd like to be appointed to the State Arts Council. And so I became the Hillsborough County State Arts Council representative uh, from 77 through 81. Uh, that's it's one of those th things. It's who you know, not what you know. Yeah. Well, uh, and and uh, you also have to be good at what you do. But it, it again, it was it was very much in my wheelhouse in terms mm -hmm. of what I was really really interested in, and and I've done a lot of things in the arts community. I've been president of the Tampa Bay Business Committee for the Arts Board. I'm back on that board now, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, uh, you know, there, there is so much, if you're, if you're a person who loves the arts, whether it's visual arts or writing or acting or music, there is so much to participate in either as a member of an audience or as a performer. Um, uh, it is, it is, it adds so much to my life to be able to be part of that community. Yeah. And I, I think we're wired for it, to be honest yes. with you. And in humanity, I think we're wired to to consume those, consume the arts, especially music. Yes. One one sort of interesting thing. Again, this is this is an aside, but I'm going to put in a plug. Uh, there's a wonderful local theater company called Stageworks, mm -hmm. and they're they're uh, putting on a a play, and I just can't remember the name of the play, but it's coming up in the spring, and it's a play that, that was written by a playwright from Tampa. And the subject matter is the 1964 sit-ins that closed the Woolworths mm -hmm. <laughs> downtown. Wow. That was, that was when there were protests in Alabama and in Georgia and in Carolina and in Florida uh, that were civil rights oriented. And we had our own here in Tampa. There were, there were uh, some riots uh, here, not as, not as, uh, uh, inflamed as, as in uh, Alabama. Uh, and he wrote that play and it's being uh, staged by Stageworks. My wife and I are underwriting the play. Wow. So where can we find that? that it's play? Stageworks. And oh, and Stageworks. It's, it's Stageworks is in the Channel Side okay. district. And, and if you want to go online uh, and look at the, at the Stageworks uh, website, it'll tell you when the play is being performed. Well, absolutely. But do it's that. really. It, to me, it's a it's a part of Tampa history uh, that's being done by a Tampa playwright. I thought that was really a lot of fun. Underwritten by a Tampa institution. Yeah. <laughs> Pete, I love it. Well, Pete, it's been a pleasure talking to you today, and I really appreciate it. We're definitely going to follow Stageworks and learn about the play. Where can we um, keep track of the concerts that you guys are playing, follow you, follow your thought leadership? The... Um, uh, the Tampa Community Band doesn't have a website. We're sort of uh, belt and suspenders, if you will. Uh, but the Plant Museum uh, performance, the picnic in the park, is so, so much fun because mm -hmm. uh, the, the entire Plant Museum experience is Victorian. And so they have uh, a lot of people running around the park in, in Victorian costumes. Well, that does sound fun. And dresses. They have one of the uh, actors who plays Teddy Roosevelt in some of the performances in the museum comes out and circulates. They've got bone shaker bicycles. Uh, they've wow. got They've got uh, uh, ladies in Victorian dresses circulating around. So it's, and, and you know, it's a real, <laughs> it's 
It's the kind of thing that you wish happened more often, but it doesn't happen enough. Yeah. Um, the East Hillsboro has a website, and okay. it has a list of our concerts um, coming up, and and that is a really really first class band, great conductor uh, Kevin Lewis, um, wonderful musicians, a bunch of music directors, and and uh, former professional uh, musicians. Uh, and so you can go on their website, Eastern Hillsboro Community Band, and you can find what they do and when they perform. We'll definitely go and check that out. And you can find our podcast and check us out anywhere where podcasts are found across the Law of Relevancy podcast and also all the Bake More Pies social media. Thank you for joining us. Pete, thank you for joining us. It's been a total pleasure, Cords, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing whether I passed my screen test. <laughs> you did with flying colors. Thank you. We'll catch you next time. Thank you.